Good afternoon. This is Angela Evat in the Maryland Healthcare Commission. I want to uh, welcome everybody on uh, the line to our uh, CRISP update and patient identity proofing uh, presentation. This is a 12 to 1.30 presentation, um, and it uh, was brought together uh, by the request of our uh, HIE Policy Board participants. The HIE Policy Board is a staff advisor group charged with making recommendations around policy um, to ensure the privacy and security of information exchange by HIE. Um, we wanted to bring together this, uh, this lunchtime webinar to provide some updates around the services um, planned and, um, and currently being provided by uh, our state designated HIE, CRISP, um, as well as um, an overview of some of the patient identity proofing challenges being faced um, by HIEs. We hope that this presentation will be informative to the policy board uh, participants as it continues to discuss policies related to our health information exchanges in the state of Maryland. I'd like to first um, do a few housekeeping issues. Uh, I want to note that all few, uh, phones are muted right now this time just uh, to ensure that we don't have any background noises. We will unmute the phones for in the last 20 minutes during the question and discussion uh, portion of this presentation. Um, I do want to also mention that we are recording this webinar for those who aren't able to attend uh, today and it will be posted on our website for uh, review uh, by those who can't uh, participate today. So I'd like to uh, introduce uh, to you our presenters, Brandon Neislinger, VP of Operations at the Chesapeake Regional Information System for our patients, Chris, and Craig Finn, Director of Reporting and Analytics at Chris. They'll be speaking on the current and planned services, Chris, as well as patient consent and granular control and patient identity proofing and challenges. Um, thank you, and I hope you all enjoy the webinar. Brandon, uh, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you, Angela. It's, uh, it's a pleasure to be here with everyone this afternoon to just uh, take a little time and go over uh, a little bit about what CRISP has been up to, uh, bring everyone up to speed, and uh, open it up to questions uh, for, the, for the audience uh, towards the end of the, um, uh, our time together. Um, so, uh, Angela, if you could go to the next slide. Um, I, uh, our agenda today is really just one of uh, giving an overview of our services because I think an overview of our services kind of set, it sets the context for a lot of the discussions that we are uh, going to get to towards the end of the presentation, specifically around patient identity validation, et cetera. But I think it's a good time uh, for uh, the, the, the members that have come together today to uh, take a look at what it is that we're doing, et cetera, a little bit about Chris, just an overview, just in case there's some, uh, uh, I think we're doing a lot of new things that we can bring uh, people up to speed on. So we're going to talk a little bit, little bit about uh, our care coordination tools, which is really, uh, really our core set of services, and we'll go through those first. Uh, we're going to spend time on ambulatory connectivity, what that means, what some of our challenges are, how some of that data can be used. Uh, then we're gonna. I'm going to turn it over to Craig to go through our reporting services capabilities, which really is uh, meant to be how do we use all this data in reporting uh, fashion and use it to uh, facilitate care coordination and other workflows. And then, uh, as Angela already described, we'll talk about patient identity proofing and challenging challenges, and then uh, you know just have an open discussion time frame. Uh, Angela, if you could go to the next slide, please. So just, I think it's important understanding where, where CRISP is coming from. I know a lot of this may be uh, redundant to many on the, on the call, but it's just something in our deck, you know, our vision and mission, advancing health and wellness by deploying health information technology solutions uh, specifically for aimed at cooperation and collaboration. We're here to help out when we can connect organizations that don't have some of the connections already in place. And I believe that that uh, vision it becomes more uh, relevant in today's day, day and age as we're moving toward value-based payment models and uh, value-based care, et cetera. Um, uh, some guiding principles, uh, you know, incrementalism. I, hear, I know that uh, our CEO and President David Horrocks 
Uh, we like to make you know meaningful progress all of the time, uh, incremental small steps, not boil the ocean types of things. Um, and uh, as everyone, I don't want to take too much more time on this slide. Um, it's just it just reinforces uh, cooperation, collaboration, and incrementalism. Uh, and really, uh, one that we're going to focus on is pr promote and enable consumers' control over their own health information. Uh, as it's in our guiding principles, and that's what's led us to have these discussions today. Next slide, please. At CRISP, we usually define our services as three main areas. Um, we've added, we started out with one service uh, seven years ago, uh, ago, the clinical query portal. Uh, this is where information that is exchanged between our participants uh, is viewable and accessible mainly for a treatment, uh, a treatment episode or a treatment encounter. Uh, things like lab results, radiology reports, um, discharge summaries from hospitals. Um, and now as we move into uh, ambulatory connectivity, um, CCDA data that comes from um, primary care providers and specialists will be available through the clinical query portal. And we'll talk about that a little bit more in, in the upcoming slides. Additionally, uh, we have an encounter notification service, ENS. Uh, this is really, um, I think, one of our key uh, service lines. Right now, we are sending about 850,000 notifications a month to providers uh, in Maryland. Um, we have about 4.5 million uh, Maryland residents subscribed to this service, um, and uh, that, that's a very, it's about 60% of the population in Maryland. Uh, what you get out of an encounter notification service is a real-time hospital admission and discharge notification um, w that is available you know, in real time, it's available in batch mode, and we are building new capabilities to support uh, care coordination uh, workflows through this service. Um, and as, again, as ambulatory data becomes available, uh, we will augment the e encounter notification service to include uh, notifications uh, to care managers, et cetera, uh, when patients have follow-up visits with their PCP within seven days of a, a, an inpatient discharge, et cetera. Lots of workflows like that where our ambulatory data becomes more and more useful. Um, then the last service that we'll talk about, and we're going to go into all of these in a little bit more detail, uh, the CRISP reporting services. So it's basically a, a reporting and analytic tool set that supports patient identification, care coordination, and performance measurement. And I'm going to leave that one uh, alone for now, and Craig is going to step in and talk us through a lot of the cool and exciting uh, uh, products that he's working on. So all of those things in the past were mainly around treatment encounters, um, but as we are developing uh, these tools and thinking about how they evolve, uh, they are really evolving to support care coordination uh, workflows across the state. So. Um, we are here to support the HSCRC's care coordination uh, work group. Um, most of our uh, mandate has come from that, that work group. Um, and uh, we're here to support the waiver initiatives, um, uh, readmission, reduction, et cetera, many of the other goals that are aligned with the HSCRC's uh, uh, goals and mandates. Um, the resources that we're building uh, to support hospital, regional, and other uh, provider-based collaborations are primarily one of data connectivity and sharing. It will go into more detail again uh, uh, later. Uh, the population-based reporting uh, capabilities through CRS. And as we build out new capabilities and work to understand our partners and participants' needs, we always are thinking about ways to evolve our services and add new services to support these partnerships. Next, next slide, please. So what we've done here is uh, taken our, our three services, and I want to give examples of what they look like so that people understand uh, the capabilities. So the clinical query portal is the first one that I mentioned. Uh, allows credentialed users to search the HIE for clinical data. 
Uh, there's a, uh, as you can see, uh, when you go to the clinical portal, you can see clinical data that's parsed and relevant. Uh, you know, sometimes it's inpatient data, other times uh, as we grow the ambulatory data encounters, it will be available here, you, patient demographic, lab results, et cetera. Uh, the PDMP medication data is available through the clinical query portal. The PDMP uh, program actually drives about 4,000 qu queries um, a day. So it's, uh, it, it's moving very, uh, that, that's one of the most important drivers of our clinical query portal access. Um, we have 12,000 active portal user, users. Um, 18 of our hospitals have enabled single sign-on to get uh, quick access to this through their own EHR instead of having to go out and log into another um, system, which uh, is a workflow deterrent. And uh, another, uh, another um, data point is that we are receiving PDMP data from not only Maryland, but West Virginia, Virginia, and Connecticut. Next slide, please. Recently, we have piloted an image exchange um, capability that is uh, built into our query portal, where now um, real uh, live images can be viewed through our portal, not just the textual results of a radiology study. This is currently rolled out to four pilot hospitals, and we are um, gaining some traction. Uh, other organizations are interested in sharing this, and there's a lot of use cases and workflow uh, that uh, support expanding the image exchange uh, capability uh, throughout the region. Next slide. I mentioned single sign-on uh, on the first slide deck, uh, on the first slide for Clinical Query Portal. And uh, what we're doing here is uh, giving you an example of someone inside uh, an EHR system deployed at one of our hospitals where um, CRISP can be data stored uh, in the CRISP services can directly uh, can be directly accessed uh, through the EHR without the provider or the staff member leaving the EHR. This also is a security uh, upgrade as the hospital's own um, uh, Pay, uh, uh, user validation processes uh, limit and uh, enable access to our CRISP services. Next slide, please. Another upgrade uh, that we're working on in the clinical query portal is something that was previously uh, called the care profile, but we've rebranded this uh, to be called the patient care overview. And what this is, is a, a new section in the query portal that allows uh, a, a user to see care plans avail that are available by participating organizations. Uh, we get to see patient attribution, meaning who is subscribed to this patient from an ENS perspective. Uh, there's prior admissions uh, over the last 60 days. Uh, we can also see um, uh, care manager attribution, uh, similar to provider attribution, and then care alerts uh, that are built. And there's an example of how the care profile of the patient care overview uh, is uh, utilized today. There are plans to expand this according to our participants' needs uh, with other relevant uh, components, uh, such as potentially risk scores, um, uh, you know, additional care plans, um, addition care gaps provided by participants, et cetera. But as, those, uh, as, as we work with our participants to understand the value and the availability of data, uh, we, will, we will build those uh, elements into the patient care overview um, as, we, as we have them available. Next slide, please. Our next service, uh, a little bit of an overview for encounter notification services. Uh, CRISP currently receives admission, discharge, and transfer messages in real time from all of our Maryland acute care hospitals. Uh, six out of the eight DC hospitals, uh, most likely uh, the remaining two will come on board in the next uh, 90 days, all Delaware hospitals and all Inova hospitals in Virginia. Um, these, uh, this data generates real-time hospitalization notifications. 
uh, in multiple capacities across all of our hospitals. Um, we are able to deliver continuity of care documents, CCDs, um, to subscribing providers. 17 of our hospitals are currently sending a CCD to CRISP that is routed on to uh, providers that are subscribed to those patients. Um, our hospitals and our ambulatory providers that send us uh, encounter or ADT data can auto-subscribe, so they don't need to be alert. They don't need to send us new panels uh, when they uh, when they receive new patients inside uh, their care settings. Thirty-four hospitals are currently doing that, and a few of the ambulatory providers, as we work on connectivity, are starting to take advantage of this service. ENS was recently enhanced to include the ER and IT visits for a given patient within the last six months. And um, our panel customizations have uh, uh, are now including treatment groups, PCP program start end dates, insurance information. I'm going to add a couple to this since this slide is a little bit outdated. Uh, risk scores, care managers, etc., are all being uh, uh, populated through our panel um, submission process, and we can talk about that in more detail if people have questions in the future. Next slide, please. CRISP triages alerts based on your workflow. Workflow is a very important uh, element to ENS, and if you think about who should be acting on alerts, it varies between from organization to organization. In some instances, uh, an office staff member may be the one who is uh, uh, evaluating uh, a discharge notification to schedule a patient follow-up visit. Other times, a provider may directly want to know in real time if a certain patient is uh, at the emergency department, etc. cetera. Uh, all, of this, all that this slide is trying to say is that we have the capability to facilitate workflow um, that meets an organization's needs uh, using the Encounter Notification Service. Near-term additional approaches for ENS. We um, are currently working on a direct integration for ENS into um, EPIC and other EHR systems, um, how those ENS alerts can uh, show up as tasks or messages directly inside of EHRs, similar to our single sign-on concept, really just facilitating ease of workflow instead of another system that someone needs to go into. And then the other um, additional approach for ENS is a user interface um, that makes it all of the ENS uh, alerts real time. And this is a system called Prompt that is now available where um, we take you know, the spreadsheet that is delivered uh, via notification and turn it into a very, very basic uh, system that allows um, for care managers, office staff members to monitor um, their alerts in real time and uh, gives them the ability to um, aggregate, organize uh, the data that is available to them for, through their ENS, ENS alerts. Um, this, is a, this tool is gaining some popularity, and uh, unfortunately it's not integrated into any EHRs, but it's, uh, we believe this is the next, uh, this is going to be a very valuable tool set uh, uh, from a CRISP perspective. Next slide. So now we get to how does ambulatory connectivity, uh, what, what does it mean? How does it connect into uh, the current services, and how, how will we use that data to expand our current offerings? Ambulatory Connectivity Initiative focuses on expanding integration across all of the care settings, primary care, specialty practices, post-acute facilities, um, and connectivity will fil facilitate the electronic access and exchange of patient information for the purpose of improving health outcomes. Connectivity also supports other hospital and community-aligned activities uh, to be determined. We have, uh, I'm going to go through the benefit, if you can go to the next slide, Angela. The benefits of this integration are greater access to patient clinical data, um, for one, um, improving the communication and care coordination among providers and care managers. Today, uh, this doesn't happen as, as effectively as 
organizations like the ONC or the MHCC or other uh, or, or providers uh, would like it to happen. Uh, reduce the cost of care by minimizing duplication of services and auto-generate CRISPs required ENS panel data submissions. Uh, future benefits of uh, uh, ambulatory connectivity, uh, access to additional tools and reports as we will embed them into the CRS uh, capabilities, and uh, the enhanced ability to participate in alternative payment models and pay for outcomes programs. We believe that making the data available to groups potentially like ACOs, uh, you know, clinical, clinically integrated networks within hospital organizations, et cetera, will really be able to benefit by increased access to clinical data. Next slide. What we've tried to do here, and uh, maybe you will hear as you participate in further crisp discussions, is the types of data that we will be sharing. Um, we have broken this down into Tier 2 and Tier 3. Tier 1 is basically, uh, for us, Tier 1 is just a listing of patients. Uh, that's how we've, how we've uh, broken this out. Tier 2, which we've termed encounter data, is really identifying when a patient visit occurs at an ambulatory practice or SNF. Many times, um, just knowing that a patient has followed up uh, with the primary care provider, et cetera, can be very valuable from a care management perspective. Just knowing that a patient just left the hospital within seven days, there was a follow-up primary care visit, and counter data would, would make that workflow um, available through CRISP. Clinical data is primarily, we think of clinical data or tier three data as a consolidated clinical document architecture, or CCD, uh, associated with a patient visit. This includes problems, meds, allergies, um, lab results, all of the data kind of at a, at a point in time uh, after an uh, encounter has occurred at, at a primary care visit or in a SNF setting. So knowing that we break the data down into those two uh, tiers is important. Um, as we talk a little bit further, um, there is, a, there is a cost associated with the different uh, type of data here, and there's a completeness, uh, yeah, a completeness of the data that's uh, associated with the different uh, tiers here. Notes here, patient may opt out of data sharing, more on granular consent shortly, but right now patients still have the ability to say, I don't want any of my data shared, including ambulatory data, and when they opt out, data that is sent to us is filtered based on those settings and those choices by the patient, and that data does not get shared uh, across any of our, our platforms. Practice and, and skilled nursing facility encounter data is only permitted to be used for treatment or care management. There's no other permitted purposes that we can use that data for. Next slide. So we have uh, a couple of integration approaches that uh, I'm going to mention very quickly here. Um, right now we're working primarily with EHR vendors. Um, data that was uh, about a year and a half old when we were first doing analysis of the Maryland marketplace, there were over 150 different EHR vendors that were operating in the state of Maryland. Obviously, there's the 80-20 rule there where there's a top 10 or 15 that have a, a bulk of the market. And with those, uh, we're we have gone directly to the EHR vendors and have working with their leadership teams and their, um, their technical teams to develop EHR vendor-specific integrations to CRISP, and that is moving uh, forward at a, at, a, at a good pace, and I'll, I'll give you some updates on numbers shortly. Other options that are available, there is a, uh, this marketplace is growing as it becomes, you know, difficult uh, it becomes difficult to get more and more clinical data. So there are third-party integrators that are out there um, that sell services to organizations like hospitals, ACOs, HIEs that uh, are able to go out and grab clinical data and maybe even more data than what becomes available from a CCD perspective uh, to do things like clinical quality measures, et cetera, G-probe measures, 
Um, and uh, we're working with uh, three or four of those clinical uh, third-party integrators uh, to have an alternative to the EHR vendor-specific workflows. Next slide, please. Angela, can you move the slide forward? Who are you working with? I'm sorry? What companies are you working with? Um, for the third-party integration or the EHR vendor? Third-party integration. Uh, we, we, uh, there's a couple of organizations out there um, that have, that we have not, we're working on understanding their capabilities. Um, many of them are both uh, EHR third-party integrators and many of them house care management platforms as well. Um, and so that they, they're able to produce some of those, like Clinigens is a, is a name that comes to, comes to mind. Um, there's uh, Healthagents, uh, there's a couple of different organizations out there, but I can get you a full list of who we're working with if that's I one of the other yeah, so, requests. You know, I don't want to put you on the spot, but in terms of, I mean, you don't have any formal relationships, I guess I was, when you say working with, talking to them is what you're ta saying right now, but you don't have any collaboration agreements. We do not, Ben. Um, there, you know, there's, you know, we we've gotten in touch with some of these based on past uh, relationships at other organizations, and also with with other with ACOs and other organizations that we're working with that set, that have sent them, these organizations our way, huh. and we're taking a look at them. It would be some of them have some very interesting promise around being able to deliver more data than is available in the CCD but they have some of the same limitations that any normal HIE would have, specifically around cloud-hosted vendors where there's not data on site. So we can get more into that, Ben, if you want to or not. It's, uh, it's just, up to you. Oh, uh, that's fine. Thanks. All right. Great. Um, connectivity progress. So how, how, how far are we going? How quickly are we going? Um, right here, uh, what I tried to give here is a, a, a breakdown in terms of both practices and physicians. And the way we uh, measure our productivity uh, in terms of connecting to the ambulatory space is in these uh, agreed in development. I mean, agreed would mean organizations have said, we want to connect our data with CRISP. In development means they have taken a next step. We are either working with their EHR vendor or um, you know, there, there's a contract that's in place uh, development resources are being tasked on this tier two and tier three. I already mentioned what they were, encounter data versus ambulatory data. And so the first uh, one is pra by practice or organization, the first, uh, uh, the first table there. And then what we've done is a physician breakdown. How do the tier two practices, which are 370 organizations, how many physicians do those, um, uh, you know, come out to be, and then right now we have tier two connectivity in the ambulatory market with uh, 2,022 uh, physicians. Tier three, only 85, that is the slowest and the most expensive, et cetera, but we're starting to gain traction with some of the major EMR vendors, um, and it's becoming uh, less and less of a, an issue we've gotten through the first couple waves of integration. Those numbers should begin to move quickly. Next slide, Angela. At this point in time, I'm going to turn it over to Craig for our last service and overview. He has a lot of pictures and a lot of data to go through, but uh, uh, he'll get through it in, in a reasonable amount of time. Yeah, thank you very much, um, Brandon and Angela and Ben and um, everybody else for listening. Um, so I'll, I'm at a I have a little bit of background in crisp reporting services more broadly. And then as Brandon said, we have a lot of pictures, um, hopefully to keep people engaged. Um, so first, just a level set. Um, CRS has been around for a few years now, and our original intent or, or the, the reason for Chris working um, in this capacity was to support the HSCRC in monthly reporting for hospitals. And so as I'm sure you're all familiar, the hospitals submit data monthly to the HSC, HSCRC under uh, regulatory authority, and they take that data and give it to Chris who, through an end-user agreement, is then able to match it with our MPI and our patient identities, um, 
and then provide the data back to the HSCRC for, for uh, policy and other permitted purposes, but also then back to the hospitals through a CRISP portal um, so that the hospitals uh, can understand their own performance against things like the um, hospital acquired condition, the readmission reduction program, and other uh, relevant statistics, mostly in a financial realm. And that's really been the, the tradition. Uh, the allowable data use, we'll talk a little bit more about that in a few slides. Um, but it, it varies depending on the user and the report type. Uh, so the next slide, uh, just to provide a little more detail on the data, um, we obviously have data from multiple sources. Um, so again, we're taking that, that case mix, which is basically hospital claims data. Now we're matching it with the CRIP uh, enterprise identifier, the, the patient ID. And then we can add things like geocoding. Um, we also look at other data sets, uh, the Medicare a chronic condition warehouse to look at, at to add chronic conditions um, to patients. We look at census data so we can population normalize for a, a zip code or census region or county. And then we're also now taking the ADT feeds that Brandon spoke about both from hospitals and um, and from ambulatory providers and SNFs. So we can do some panel-based reporting and look at things like overlap on number of subscribers. Um, we have a number of different web uh, online portals, uh, which we'll talk about in a second. And um, I like to, to keep this note um, that we've developed most of the logic in conjunction with the HSCRC. So something like a, a CRISP reporting services readmission uh, matches perfectly with the HSCRC rate year readmission logic. Um, and so the good news is that we are 100% aligned and if you see our readmission in the CRISP reporting portal, um, you'll see a readmission directly from HSCRC. Um, the only downside of that is that you know we are not completely flexible. You know, we as we work towards more care coordination use cases, we want to provide more flexibility in how um, you know eligible and appropriate users can access and and calculate their own downstream analytics. Um, but for now, you know, a readmission is based on a readmission logic, and it essentially is what it is. Uh, next slide. Um, so these, this is just an example of the two portals. Um, one, the left side is a static portal with individually credentialed folders. So a, uh, a CFO can log in and I said that view um, their hospital's current performance against the readmission reduction program. Um, the dynamic dashboards you'll see on the right side um, are developed through Tableau and it gives a more interactive uh, user experience. And, and the purpose there, um, now the, way, the, the way I mentally segment this is the left side is policy, finance, um, uh, maybe less intuitive but more specific reports. Um, the right side is, you know, dynamic dashboards that uh, a care coordinator or a director of quality and ambulatory physician could log into um, to view uh, their patient data in a variety of ways they can better understand and therefore better treat uh, cohorts of patients. The next slide, um, as we talk about the care coordination use cases, really what we're trying to do are three primary things. Uh, those are listed, the high risk patient identification, supporting coordination, and then helping people measure performance. Um, so I'm going to take you through a number of slides now, uh, hopefully pretty quickly with some pictures on them, uh, to give you a sense of the kinds of tools that we either have or are developing. For this. Um, the first one that um, is now widely used by hospitals. It's called the PATH report, the patient total hospitalization. Um, this is a dashboard that essentially allows users to drill down and you can look at um, some summary patient data. And then once you've identified a specific cohort and if you have the appropriate credentials and you're using the report appropriately, you can look at some, some more detailed information. And then you can actually, um, again, for only permitted uses, look at individual patient information um, based on your own treatment relationship so you can better understand the past 12 months of hospitalization information for a patient. Uh, right now, this report is only available for hospitals, and hospitals can only see patients that they've had an encounter with in the past 12 months. Um, but again, we're looking at what other use cases are appropriate and what other uh, potentially physicians or CRISP participants would be appropriate to have this kind of information um, obviously with appropriate limitations. Uh, so the next slide is the summary view, just an example. 
Um, you can see a variety of filters on the side, uh, and then different uh, you know, graphical interfaces. I'm not going to go through the details here, but if people are interested or curious about these, then by all means, I'm happy to go through in more depth. Uh, the next slide shows you that the next detailed view where you can sort essentially those same filters and those bars from the front summary view into individuals, and then you click look at individual utilization. Uh, the next page um, are a couple examples of regional reports we put out. And um, again, these reports are essentially to show, um, you know, maybe in the top left example, Baltimore City, um, where patients, based on where they live, are experiencing care. That's an aggregate report, um, and in those cases, we uh, suppress all cell sizes that are, that are fewer, 10 or fewer. Um, we also, and I, I should have made this note earlier, and I probably would have later, um, I might say it again, but um, for aggregate reports, uh, we include all patients. Uh, it's HFCRC case mix data, and therefore we get information on all patients. But for anything that is not cell size suppressed or that is patient specific, we block all CRISP opt-outs. Um, and then all and all 42 CFR Part 2 covered visits. And we actually use a pretty uh, broad filter on that just to be safe. Um, so we're very mindful of, of permitted uses and, and, and we think a lot about who's appropriate to get that data. Um, the next slide uh, is a couple examples of performance measurement reports. Um, we have no ability nor desire to produce a true return on investment for any CRISP participants. But what we can do is, is things like tell you year over year how much your readmission rate has changed or how many total discharges you had or ED visits you had. Um, and so we're, we're hoping that by doing more things like that, we can help both hospitals and SNFs and physician, uh, independent physician groups, you know, really understand their hospital utilization so that they can partner with their, with other healthcare providers um, to enhance their own treatment relationships. Uh, and then I think second to last, like I said, there are a lot of pictures. Uh, this is a snapshot of a key metric dashboard that we're putting out soon. You can develop with, in partnership with the HSCRC um, to help show hospitals how they're doing on very specific metrics um, so they can know in real time um, whether or not some of their programs are effective. Um, I didn't purposely make all these metrics screen, but I guess this hospital is doing a good job. Um, and then finally, um, we want to support practices in some of these same initiatives. Um, and so the text is probably way too small to read. But um, we're thinking that the more, and we've heard feedback, that the more we can show to practices about their own potentially avoidable utilization and readmission and ED utilization rate, the more both practices and the hospitals can work together on specific programs and wraparound services. Um, so we're hoping that providing some of that insight is, um, is supportive. And, um, and so we can, we'll, we'll get to questions and answers again later, um, but hopefully this was a nice overview and people have a sense of, of how we're trying to support the broader community. Um, the next slide, just to highlight again um, how seriously Chris takes privacy and security. Um, you know, we have password changes and we encrypt CHI both at, in transit and at rest. Um, we remove certain things like, uh, or, or limit client-side rendering. Um, and the next section you're going to hear about is really a focus on making sure the right data is only available to the right people with industry best standards. So Brandon, that yes. Uh, thank you, Craig, for that, that lead into our next section. I think uh, one other uh, component as we talk about um, some of the, the connectivity that we're building out and how we're doing it is really focused on how to make sure that the right people have the right information at the right time with the patient's uh, consent and control. Uh, the whole theme of the next couple of uh, uh, minutes here in our discussion will be how we are building uh, capabilities so patients have more granular control over how their protected health information is moving between organizations through the state designated uh, entity, which is CRISP. So uh, one of our key uh, technology components that I'm going to spend just a little bit of time on is something that we're calling the data router, um, which is really uh, just 
a, a rules engine inside of uh, CRISP that understands certain elements of uh, of how data, how to categorize certain elements of data, where it should go, how do, how do we attribute or match patients with uh, entities that have relationships with them appropriately, and how do we make sure that uh, when we send data, data is normalized or it's all understandable by a receiving organization. So uh, I don't need to, I'll just kind of read this off as the router is the service that includes uh, functionalities for connectivity, consent management, data routing to other services or data consumers, and determine patient provider relationships. Uh, these approaches will rely on connectivity through a health system, through a hosted EHR, directly to the practice or via administrative networks such as clearing houses, etc. We can go to the next uh, slide. We'll talk a little bit more about it. So connectivity and routing. Uh, again, back to um, a little bit more granular uh, detail here about ambulatory connectivity. This is in, includes a range of connectivity approaches, uh, third-party integrators, uh, direct to EHRs, clearinghouse uh, administrative, like uh, for, for instance, pre-adjudicated claims data could be leveraged for encounter data, et cetera. So there's a lot of different opportunities for connectivity. Normalization is a big issue in today's um, healthcare, uh, healthcare world. Um, sometimes code sets and mappings aren't used uh, ubiquitous, ubiquitously across, the, uh, across organizations and normalizing that data, even down to you know, provider level data around phone numbers, accessibility, et cetera, all of that is part of the normalization capabilities that we're planning to build out. Relationship determination, how do we know when a patient is a, a member of an ACO or a health plan or has a treatment relationship with a hospital? All of those uh, types of relationships are uh, going to be managed through our patient and provider relationship uh, engine. And then consent, so if we can go to the next slide, we'll talk more about consent and what that means. So the router consent engine is a centrally managed consent engine that will still require provider and care management patient engagement and a significant patient education campaign. We know that there is a patients need more and more education about how HIEs um, operate in the state and what their options are. And we'll talk about that in a little bit. Patients will be given additional granularity over clinical data um, made available through, uh, through CRISP. So let me take a couple seconds here and talk a little bit about this. So if we think about the different types of data that we receive, whether that's hospital data, whether that's a primary care data, whether it's specialty data, um, whether it's data from payers, uh, data from anyone who is participating with us and has uh, uh, agreed to be uh, working with CRISP, patients should know, one, the type of data that we're able to move or utilize, and then two, who is receiving that data. And with the new technology enhancements that we're rolling out around granular consent, we want to give patients the uh, opportunity to say, I'm okay if my hospital data gets transmitted to my PCP. I'm not so uh, sure I want specialty data being sent to my PCP or back to a hospital or care manager. This type of granular control over the type of data and who it gets sent to is, I think, vital to uh, increasing patients' ability to manage their own data. Another uh, very, uh, another um, use case that we have used a lot when we, understand, when we talk about the need for granular control in a day-to-day -day setting is I've been assigned a PCP and I go to that primary care doc and I don't really like his services. I switch 
to a new doctor, and she's great, and uh, I think she does great for my family and myself, and I don't really have a relationship with the previous primary care doctor any longer. That doctor may have submitted that they have an active relationship with, with the patient and would still potentially get an alert. Making that information available to the patient and making them let them understand how data is being used and managed is very important as those are the types of uh, use cases that have pushed us towards this granular model. Um, if we can go to the next slide, I think uh, I covered we believe that there is a clear need for greater patient awareness and control over their data. Like I talked about patient relationships and education is the responsibility of participating providers and organizations. CRISP can do better to support our participants in terms of um, uh, marketing materials, at, you know, uh, communication materials, etc. I know that we, we continue to push um, our, uh, our capabilities in educating patients, etc. Uh, our subgroup of our CRISP board is reviewing best practices to communicate this uh, and educate patients more effectively. And um, like I said, the router technology enables more specific customization over where data goes, no longer just all out or all in. So what are this next slide talks a little bit about patient identity validation, but before I get there, I want to take a couple minutes to talk about why patient identity validation and, and why would we, we need to talk about this. So how will we give patients more granular consent over where their data goes? Um, if you think about it, there are two different ways in which we can enable this. One is a collaboration between the provider and the patient, meaning the provider would identify that the patient is Brandon Nicewender and Brandon does not want his uh, ambulatory data being shared through CRISP and the provider and the staff are able to send in, uh, you know, uh, uh, a request by the patient to opt Brandon out of, uh, of ambulatory data. That is one way to do it, and it could be it could work better in a care management um, uh, uh, care management or care coordination type of a, uh, a workflow. There might be some some limitations to that model. Really, the patient they, they might not feel as much control. The second option that's out there and has been uh, leveraged in, in organizations and other HIEs at uh, in a limited scope is a patient or a consumer website, one of which would allow them to view clinical data, but the other would be to manage their consent options. And one of the biggest hurdles around um, any website where a patient logs in is identifying that that patient is who they are and uh, making sure that they have access to, uh, they can make the decisions for that patient or in other, other, other instances of HIEs, delegates, family members, et cetera. So patient identity validation, um, how would we do that? We're going to talk a little bit about some of the barriers, et cetera, but uh, in my experience and through some of the research that we've done here at CRISP, there's a variety of ways and data sources that can aid us in patient identity validation. Public records, credit reports, uh, consumer demographic data, self-reported marketing data, et cetera. All of these are uh, valid sources um, from organizations like Experian, Ideology, LexisNexis. There's many, TransUnion, there's many different organizations out there that um, pool a lot of this data. Um, there's, there's some issues with different types of data sets. Not all patients have credit, credit history, um, which would, you know, would, we wouldn't be able to create an, enough of a question and answer type of a protocol for them to validate their own identity. Um, you know, in-person identity validation is probably not scalable, etc. cetera, um, you know, from a CRISP perspective. And then um, knowledge-based authentication, when you get all of this, this, these data sources, 
Um, I know many of you fill out uh, banking questionnaires, etc., to set up your own security questions, or um, you answer data like I've owned uh, which car in the last five years I've been a resident of X address over the last 15 years, etc. And there's lots of algorithms out there that say if you can answer four of these questions correctly, you can identify, you can be X percent uh, confident that that is the person that's answering the questions, etc. So there's a lot of these types of services out there. If we go to the next slide, Angela. Some of the uh, patient identity validation issues that come up commonly as barriers. Um, one is cost in terms of uh, you know, software and um, setup to integrate into diff different, uh, diff different components of our services, specifically a login page, et cetera. And that, that, the cost there is probably not the biggest barrier. I think the largest barrier around cost is ongoing fees. So for instance, let's just say that you know, at $1 per customer per identity validation, you know, if, if we had all of the patients in Maryland who were subscribed to, I mentioned that number earlier, about 4.5 million, um, you could see how those costs could quickly accelerate. Um, I don't think that that's, I'm not saying it's going to cost $4.5 million to implement some type of system. I'm just saying in general, the scope, costs could become a barrier. That's always something we think about. Time and effort, you know, these are things that if they become uh, a need and we move towards patient identity validation. Um, there are new software technologies. How do we implement that correctly? Those are just some of the, 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 the near-term uh, barriers that most organizations face when they put these systems in place. Uh, I've, I've worked with four or five of these organizations in the past and um, their software is usually fairly easy to deploy it works fairly well. I think the biggest problem is coming to an understanding of what questions do we ask, how do we, how do we know um, when to re-ask a question, how do we identify when a person has uh, you know, uh, missed two of the questions, didn't know the answer. There's a lot of support and operational uh, needs that go into building a long-term sustainable program. So with that, I think you know, we've, we've taken up about an hour of the time so far. I would say that with this context, I, I would leave another half hour for questions and discussion, if that's okay with you, Angela. Yes, thank you, um, Brandon, and thank you, Craig, for, for all the details of that. That presentation is very helpful. What we'll do now is we'll um, open the line up for questions. Just give us one second while we... No, we can hear you. Yeah, we can hear you. You can hear us? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yes. Great. I was just giving a, a bit of housekeeping on the uh, question and answer session. Just to reiterate, um, if you're only going to listen to the question and answer session, please put your own phone on mute. Um, if you plan on not asking a question, please identify your, your name and maybe your organization. Um, so we will um, take questions now. to go first. I believe I heard Shauna on the line. Shauna, do you have any questions? Um, of course, I have a lot of questions. I guess, um, you know, uh, w we've been talking about uh, 
patient access and we understand the uh, potential hurdles for uh, identity proofing and authentication, yet at the same time we've talked about a number of ways that uh, you could do that, including the latest uh, volunteer ID uh, proposal being uh, the petition by AHIMA, but through providers and, and any willing provider uh, being willing to sort of authenticate, which they increasingly arguably do for their own portals and, you know, how that might translate. And I guess I'm wondering been explored, and if not explored, what's the receptivity to looking at some of those alternatives? Uh, Sean, I'll take a first crack at that. I, I think you know that Chris is open to all, uh, all options for identity validation. I do agree that in some HIE models that I've worked in in the past, uh, identity validation was happening at the provider level. Um, those were usually uh, in closed systems, uh, you know, not at the, you know, not centrally at an HIE. I think one of the the issues is um, in that particular model, uh, a patient may go to a provider that doesn't necessarily offer a patient portal, may not be participating in meaningful use, etc., and being able to get some sort of a a data element that validates that this patient was authorized by Dr. X, et cetera, um, that would be more difficult. So I think what we're talking about here would be, you know, is there an opportunity for a combination? Can we do some sort of centralized identity validation and then work with that provider community that is uh, identifying or validating patient's identity at the point of care? So I, I think we would absolutely be open to that as an opportunity for us to um, maybe eliminate some of the barriers around cost, et cetera. Um, I don't know exactly how that would work, but uh, I'm sure that there's a technological solution uh, that EHR vendors have in place. I don't know if there's any other thoughts, if, if that answers your question, or... It's a good start. <laughs> Uh, you know, if, we, if there's specific organizations that are doing this that you know of, Sean, we would love to have that conversation with them and see if there's, you know, you know, a secondary approach versus an all centralized one. I guess just a quick follow. -up. I think you're doing. I think you're doing that uh, today, aren't you, Sean? Right. You're doing that with. I guess a quick follow up that puts uh, perhaps Ben a little bit on the spot is: Will these regional partnerships? Um, potentially be a means for um, enabling in off, you know, some sort of identity proofing. I mean, the problem is you have to start somewhere and you have to see what what's real and what is um, anticipated but not really a challenge, like to the extent that people are willing to go somewhere physically to do this, perhaps, or whatever the case may be. But I think it's easy to say it's not going to work for the following reasons until you actually try it um, with, with more than just a, a small sample. So um, Ben has stepped out for the moment, um, so I won't, I won't speak for him. But um, I think this is a good discussion. Are others on the line um, that would like to follow up on that question or comment or have other questions? Well, this is Sarah Posner. Um, I am interested in this patient website um, option, and I'm, you know, I, I'm not even sure what to begin to ask about that other than um, how would that be managed? Would that be something provided through Chris that would be um, accessed, you know, at perhaps at home on a, on a home computer, um, the way we do when we check our bank statements or when we go on to MyChart, which is a lot of um, providers use the MyChart system now. Hi, Sarah. This is Brandon. Um, so we do envision, uh, you know, a website 
um, if this is the, the way we go, which would be, you know, a portal for patients. And I believe the reason, you know, Angela and her team have put together this, this uh, discussion is how, how do patients get access, how do they understand where their data is moving, um, they do have certain uh, capabilities through the MyChart systems uh, of the world today, which are great. Um, you know, I personally have a MyChart account. I know my wife does. It's, it, it's great. Um, what we would envision is an opportunity for patients to uh, log in, I validate who they are, and then be able to um, see who is subscribed to their data, see um, uh, be able to manage it there like I, I talked about. So it would be kind of a always on, always available type of a service from CRISP. That's the way it's being envisioned. Um, whether or not, you know, the first piece of that is a provider aided capability to communicate so that we can move faster. Um, you know, just communicating and educating patients at the point of care um, on their options. That That's where we're going in the very near term, but building those uh, that website would be the ultimate goal. Thank you. So we're uh, we're getting a few questions um, on the the webinar, um, and I'll uh, take a few of those right now, and then turn it over to folks who want to uh, verbally ask a question. Um, so um, our first one is: Is there a cost to using uh, the care management tools that you went through, Craig? Um, so first, let me just clarify, um, the reports are not care management tools. I think they're a potential input into a care management program uh, as you look at identifying um, specific eligible patient types or, um, or measuring changes in utilization. Um, but it's not, it's by no means, even 10% of the care management tool. Um, to the probably heart of the question, no. Um, there are no direct costs to uh, current CRISP participants to use CRISP reports. Um, we're currently obviously funded through the hospital fees that uh, CRISP funds operations through, and then also a lot of the, the current um, care coordination work is being funded through the integrated care network infrastructure um, uh, through the HSCRC. Craig, what, uh, what type of ambulatory rollout do we have and utilization of some of those reports? Did you mention that? Yeah. So. Um, I didn't, probably not as explicitly as I should have. Um, majority of the reports right now are hospital focused because we already had significant hospital data and very firm data use policies around hospital data. Um, we're, we have a goal by the end of this quarter to roll out pilot reports to 20 ambulatory practices. And, um, and if it goes like most CRISP pilots, I think we're going to expand very rapidly um, as soon as we're comfortable. It should be very quickly. Great. Thank you, Craig. Um, another uh, question that sort of touched on the point that Shauna made from uh, Tom Lewis. Medical practices already validate patient identity um, and offering opt-in, opt-out. What problems do you see in simply accepting the hospital or practice identity verification? You know, it could be as simple as uh, when we receive a panel, there's some sort of, uh, you know, positive affirmation in, in a data element that would allow us to say, you know, uh, Tom's group uh, has identified, validated this patient's identity. Uh, but we need to match it across more than one EHR vendor. So I think we'd have to, I, I see that we would be able to say this patient was identified uh, you know, validated, we're giving you a CRISP account to log in, et cetera, but, you know, we are using our own MPI, and we'd have to just look at some of the technical, uh, the technical issues there, and, and that I, that I, I don't know all of them, what, what would pop up, but I just feel like accepting a validation from a practice that is not, you know, is it a signed piece of paper, is it, you know, some sort of a, legal document where, you know, you know, from a liability perspective, we can accept that. There's just a lot of, I think, a lot of different questions that come up as to who is, what is the source of truth for patient identity validation, and do practices take that on? Does CRISP take it on? I think that those are some of the, the discussion points that we would have to uh, 
you know, vet out and tease out. Thank you, Brandon. Um, before I, I continue to turn to the questions on the screen, I just wanted to see if there are uh, any questions somebody want to pose um, verbally. I, this is Linda Smith, and I just wondered if the slides are going to be available uh, to us after today, because there was a lot to take in in a short time period. <laughs> Understood. Uh, absolutely. We'll be um, sharing the slides with um, those who we invited as well as, uh, as I mentioned earlier, in the uh, presentation we are recording right now. Um, and we'll post that, uh, the recording, on our website and share that with, uh, with those this week as well. Thank you um, very much. Yeah, no problem. An another question now. Oh, did I get some money? Another question that was posed um, on the webinar uh, from Walter Suarez. Is CRISP retaining any patient identifiable clinical data, uh, such as copies of CCDs by hospitals? Or is CRISP primarily reading the information between two providers? What is CRISP doing with patient identifiable data it retains if it does? So there's certain elements that uh, uh, CRISP retains um, in terms of, in, you know, when we talk about encounter data. Um, that data is used as we route it, um, and it's used for uh, attributing patients. We do have a, uh, a logically separated area hosted by one of our vendors, uh, MRF, that does, uh, you know, from a, a virtual edge perspective, we, we have some of that data that can be used to aggregate, such as radiology results from the hospitals, et cetera. Um, but we can talk about, you know, that data becomes available as it's queried, um, but there's you know somewhat of a you know a, an architecture that's built in to keep the data segregated uh, between organizations. And if we need to talk about that more, we we can. Um, there are elements, obviously, in terms of what we do that are PHI. So, for instance, an admission to a ED department, which is an ADT record. We do keep that data um, so that we can utilize it for reporting, um, uh, matching patient identities, and creating some of the reports that we uh, deliver to the HSCRC. So there is actual PHI that is in our uh, that we do manage and maintain, all, all under a security umbrella, um, which is. Uh, HIPAA compliant and uh, audited quite frequently um, and uh, adheres to all of the regulatory uh, requirements for housing PHI. Thank you, Brandon. Any follow-up to uh, that question and answer? Um, so briefly, you talked uh, about routing uh, CCDs through the ENS as well as getting uh, CCDs from from hospitals. Uh, maybe if you can take a moment to talk a little bit about um, briefly what a CCD is for those who might not be familiar and answer the question in terms of is the content of a, a specific uh, CCD um, contingent on that provider that's sending it as well as the completeness of that CCD? Okay, I'll take a first crack at that, Angela, and you can uh, tell me if I don't go uh, deep enough into this. Um, but the CCD, or the Consolidated Clinical Document Architecture, um, a CCD is one form of that, a Consolidated Clinical Document. Um, first and foremost, it is based on the provider's information about the patient. So. For instance, if you're looking at for a complete longitudinal record for a patient, uh, the CCD would not necessarily have that when it's delivered from, say, a hospital organization who may only have, you know, one or you know, you know, clinical history from you know an inpatient setting, etc. But the CCD would contain certain elements um, that are required from a regulatory perspective. Uh, so, such as problems, medications, allergies, patient demographic information, um, and all of that would be um, uh, populated through the EHR system. Now, 
for your second question, uh, we w we do not validate CCD data. So we do not, you know, from a completeness perspective, we are seeing everything from, you know, 25% populated based on the, the type of encounter all the way through to, you know, you know, population of every field. And much of that uh, content uh, also is uh, predicated on EHR configuration and workflow from a documentation perspective. So in general, the industry is sending CCDs that are, one, uh, this is a common complaint that we hear, they're bloated, they have too much information, it's hard to find uh, the information that's valuable as a transition occurs. Um, and then second, it's like, well, there's not, the real information isn't there. That's one of the things that we're trying to do in the, the router, the, uh, the normalization engine. What types of data are, are valid? Or is there a, you know, air quotes, top sheet that we can, we can build that makes uh, delivering the CCDA to the next uh, care provider more valuable? So um, there's a lot we could do on that, but uh, Angela, did that answer your question? It did. Thank you. Others on the line? Briefly, you uh, talked about um, providers subscribing to patients. Um, and then um, when you were talking a little bit about ambulatory connectivity, you had mentioned um, the ability to auto-generate uh, patient panel. Can you talk a little bit about um, how a provider subscribes and why would they? Sure. Um, so today's uh, workflow for subscribing to alerts through ENS uh, in the ambulatory space is largely one of uh, what we call panel generation and uploading. So uh, I would go to practice A. We would uh, onboard the participant, uh, make sure the participation agreements and the BAAs and the NPPs have the appropriate uh, language. We would hand out all of our patient education materials and validate that uh, the education was being performed and the, and the material were available to the patients. Once that's done, um, to be able to subscribe to alerts, I, they, the practice would generate a list of all of the patients that they want to receive alerts on. And we call that list a patient panel. That patient panel is sent to us and is uploaded into our system and is uh, connected to that practice and has the delivery configurations that they built. Auto subscription is very much the same process, except that the panel is created in real time based on an ADT record or a demographic data record that we would receive from the practices uh, EHR or practice management system. So the auto subscribe is really just a continuous panel management um, type of a capability. Does that make sense? Yes. One question that we received um, on the WebEx is, where is the list of EHR vendors and status of integration? So briefly, you talked about um, integration in Tier 1, Tier 2, and some groupings. Um, the question is, where is the list of EHR vendors that you're working with to integrate? And their um, We can make that list available. I don't think it's on our website at the moment. I think it's been built into our connection efforts, but it's not a publicized list at the moment. If that's a request, we can make that available. Okay. Um, getting back to um, the discussion around uh, a consent engine and providing patients with more granular consent, um, and I might have missed this, but did you speak a little bit about sort of the implementation time frame and what you're looking at building out in, in, uh, in the future in terms of timing? Yes, from a granular consent model, uh, we plan to be live with the ability to block things like ambulatory data separate from hospital data um, in, the, in, the, in, the, in this quarter, um, barring any technical uh, issues that uh, come up. Uh, longer term, um, we are just starting to, you know, build out a plan 
in terms of when would you know uh, patient validation and patient uh, login be available. I don't have any timeframes for that. I think it's all contingent on uh, things like uh, CRISP participants uh, on the MHCC policy. Uh, all of those types of things are, are still kind of up in the air and we wouldn't want to get out too far out in front of that knowing that we're talking about consumer access at this point in time. Brandon, can you uh, help all of us understand a little bit better? So the the granularity that you're envisioning is, uh, you know, it's all sort of just tightening, you know, narrowing the opt-out, if you will, and still generating from the endpoint participating providers, and then the more consumer-driven granularity that might arguably be the way the care pro profile that you showed gets determined ideally in the long run, that's going to be dependent on a consumer direct access? Um, I think I would say it just a, a little bit differently. Um, when we think about um, the granularity, we would like it to be patient driven. But when you think about the patient care overview that is really more of a care coordination tool, uh, we we, we want care coordination organizations to help drive that as well, meaning care coordination organizations need to make sure that their patients do check the, the right boxes in terms of uh, consent that says, I am giving my consent to this ACO or this uh, care management organization to view data that's been collected throughout uh, the, you know, the care throughout disparate care settings. So I don't know if I'm answering the question uh, appropriately, but so I, I guess I right now you see the care profile as being provider driven, um, and I and arguably care coordination driven. So a care management, you know, in, unless it's an ACO or uh, integrated delivery network where you are a member of that network and have already sort of seeded that. But in, in the fee-for-service world, one could argue that the individual really is that care manager. So right. I guess I'm wondering if ultimately, at least in, in, in that context, would the individual eventually, not necessarily from the start, <laughs> to define who who participates really in that care profile. Right. Uh, from a, I'm going to try to answer this from a technical specification that you're trying to, to communicate. Are you saying that it would be best if Chris locked down the patient care overview to only patients who have explicitly said I can share this, which would say all, all organizations that I actively am a member of care management can view the care overview. Is that the way you would envision it working, Shauna? Something like that, but just, I mean, as, it's, as it is today or as you're rolling it out, there is not per se a role for the, um, a direct role for the patient except it's translated, and I'm one, and I'm looking for at what point and in what context could that start being a part of that, um, you know, sort well, of critical coordination point. Yeah, I think that there's two things that I, I will, I will, I want to reiterate here. One is patients always have the right to remove all of their data so that that care overview and all of the data available in the query portal or through ENS is not visible. Well, we're so they they have that right today, and they can. There, there's multiple ways that they can communicate through uh, to CRISP to eliminate uh, that information from being shared. I think in the future, what we're trying to we're trying to say is there may be elements that some people want to share and are okay with, but others that are not. And as we get better at be you know cre giving granular control to patients, they will be more. They will have the flexibility to say, some of these services are valuable to me and these are my, the providers I want to share with. 
um, others are not. And that's all that we're saying here from a, how do we how do we improve granular control? Like right. and it really. I just like ahead. to apply it to that those care profile functionalities, which are sort of critical to that granularity. Anyway, I don't want to. I'm done. No, I, I, I agree. It is a good point, Sean. I, I do think that um, right now the way the granular control would be applied to the patient care overview, which is the new brand name for the care profile would be um, if any of that data was supplied by ambulatory practices, they would say, uh, they would be able to say, I don't want my ambulatory data shared, which would mean the ENS subscription would not be available on their care profile. If a care manage or a care plan was submitted, that would be considered ambulatory data and it wouldn't be made available through that care profile. Um, if they said it's okay for ambulatory data to be shared but not hospital data, um, then hospital admissions over the past 60 days wouldn't be available in the care uh, overview. So that's, that's the granularity that we'll have. Um, in the future, we're going to want that more specific, meaning data can be shared between Dr. X and Dr. Y, but uh, this other doctor is not part of my care team. Thank you, Brandon. Uh, thank you, Shauna. Any any other questions on the line? So briefly, you mentioned Craig um, when you uh, were overviewing uh, the many dashboards and tools around reporting. Um, you had mentioned that most of them are hospital focused. Um, how does uh, Chris uh, plan or does plan to develop uh, services and build? Uh, develop new service reporting services and build them out. Um, so how are the, the reporting tools that are in development or going to be planned uh, decided upon? Yeah, um, so I'll, I'll, Chris has, the way most Chris services are, are thought about and, and the way they evolve is through a, a pretty robust um, committee structure. And so in my case, the reporting and analytics committee is a subcommittee of the board. And, um, and they, they typically give strategic direction and, and input on both current and, and future offerings. Um, that committee has representatives from um, state agencies, from uh, ambulatory practices, from hospitals, from other industry reps. And so that tends to be um, the group that helps prioritize and give input on these things. Uh, beyond that, you know, certainly as, as we go out there and train and release new reports, we're, we're consistently taking feedback. And then in certain cases, like uh, for example, we know that we really want to support post-acute uh, facilities. And so we're working with a handful of, of skilled nursing facilities who are CRISP participants on specific requirements that they might have um, that we could potentially build out. Uh, so it's a pretty broad iterative process, but I'd say the reporting analyst committee is, tends to be the loudest voice uh, in the structure. Great. Thank you. So we have uh, about five minutes. I want to check to see if there's any uh, last questions. This is Sarah Posner. Um, yes, I, I'm curious to know with regards to the Granular, development of um, granular control capabilities. Is there input um, coming in from providers of uh, mental health and addiction services? Because that's an area that there's been a lot of concern um, with trying to, you know, enable um, patients in, in those areas to be able to benefit um, from HIE. Uh, Sarah, great question. We have been collaborating uh, with mental health providers, et cetera, on ways that we can uh, potentially uh, share data, which we don't at the moment um, on, because there's uh, restrictions and sensitivity, both uh, you know, uh, from a legal and a regulatory uh, requirements there. Um, but I do believe that this is one area that um, Chris is being asked to understand what are the different capabilities around 
keeping that data separate, but also enabling um, notifications that are coming from those practices. Um, some organizations are able to receive notifications if they're a mental health uh, organization that are subscribing to ENS from potentially a hospital or a primary care doctor, but we are not actively taking uh, information uh, from any of those organizations in which we would be able to generate an alert at the moment. So uh, it's, uh, it's something that we're working on, and I would imagine it would be something that uh, maybe, I don't want to throw this back over the fence to Angela, but from an MHCC regulatory perspective, how, how and when can we uh, leverage that data um, through the HIE? It would be good to have some guidance uh, from the policy board. Mm -hmm. Okay, thanks. So um, that being said, I think we, we're, we're very uh, excited to continue this discussion with our uh, HIE policy board members um, in, our, uh, in our next meeting, which I believe is on the, the 29th. Um, we'll continue to have our discussion around patient identity proof in the page 26, I've been corrected, um, discussions around uh, patient consent and uh, access. Um, the last slide there, you'll see uh, Brandon, uh, Calvin, and uh, Craig's uh, contact information. If you have any questions, feel free to reach out to them. And of course, you can always reach out to the folks here at MHCC, either myself or Christine, uh, and we'll uh, be able to address your, your questions. We want to thank everybody for taking the time out of their schedule today to join us for this uh, presentation. Again, we'll, you should receive an email from us, uh, a copy of the slide deck as well as the link to the uh, recorded uh, webinar that we had today. Thank you, everybody, and have a great afternoon.